Okay, so why don't we go ahead and, and get into it. Thank you all for having me. It's, it's great to see you. I wish I saw you in person, but I hope I get to do that. I'll start knocking on doors very soon. And those of you that um, are, are my regular constituents, you know that you normally get zinnia seeds from me, and those are coming out really soon. So I hope you get those soon. If you don't get them, let me know, and, and I'm glad to drop off a packet of beautiful zinnias uh, to your house. Uh, let me, why don't I just go ahead and get started, just sort of walk through the session and what was. Um, I think a, a good way to characterize this session is that it's not over yet because we still haven't passed our budget. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the budget and what we expect, kind of what we know, what's going to be in the budget. As you know, probably aware that our fiscal year ends at the end of June, so it starts July the 1st. So we're getting super close to, to budgets that our localities and of course all state, state employees and facilities rely upon, particularly concerned about our schools more than anything else because our schools rely on a tremendous amount of money, not so much here in Arlington and Northern Virginia, but throughout the state. Uh, they rely on state dollars to fund their, their school needs and they still don't have a budget. So they don't know what they're expecting for for the next school year. So hopefully that gets all resolved very soon, but, um, but we still haven't, haven't seen a budget deal as of yet. Uh, but this was our 60 day session. You know, we, we alternate years, we meet every year. It's a very short session in both, uh, but the long session that we call it is, is a 60 day session. Uh, and, and subsequent years, it's the, a 45 day session. So it, it alternates between the two. And the reason why we have a longer session is because we deal with the budget, a uh, two year budget uh, in that 60 day session. So we need a little extra time uh, to go ahead and do that. So I'll talk a little bit about that and talk a little bit about some of the legislation that 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 didn't pass. I think that's really the story here is there's a lot of a lot of bills that were introduced, uh, some that were that were pretty dramatic shifts in, in our policy and the direction we had been going over the last couple of years, uh, but none of them passed. And, and, and probably that's, you know, some people think that divided government is best government. I think that's a, a product of that that uh, a lot of big things, a lot of big changes in the laws don't happen in divided government. And, and that's the situation that we have. So speaking of divided government, let me just talk about some of the new cast of characters. People remember the Rolling Stones in their heyday. They're probably still around actually. Uh, meet the new boss. Now it's not the same as the old boss, uh, but we do have a new cast of characters. Uh, governor Glenn Youngkin is, is our new governor. He's our 74th governor, I believe. Uh, Winsome Sears is our Lieutenant Governor, uh, African-American uh, woman historic in, in both those aspects to be the first Lieutenant Governor, uh, female and, and African-American. And Jason Miares, a Latino, I served with Jason for a number of years as a delegate, and he's now our Attorney General. So we got new cast of characters all in statewide government uh, that we're getting to know as a Commonwealth for the very first time. Well, here's the makeup of the House of Delegates and the Senate. And this is what I talked about when I said divided government. Um, the House is, is controlled by the Republicans by a vote a margin of 52 to 48. So very razor thin. Uh, Republicans don't have much room to lose. Uh, they lose one, one person on their side, more than one person, it's a tie. And anything that's a tie in the House doesn't pass. So, so that, that's, that fails. But Todd Gilbert from Shenandoah uh, Valley is our uh, Speaker of the House, a uh, Republican. Uh, and so he's got to control his caucus uh, and keep them in line so they keep all 52 votes in order to get something passed. Uh, Dick Sasloff from Fairfax County is the Senate Majority Leader, and that's controlled by Democrats, but only by 21 to 19. So they're very similar margins as they, they can't afford to lose any votes. The difference is, of course, in the Senate, they've got the lieutenant governor who can break ties. So uh, Senator Sasloff has a much bigger job because uh, he can't afford to lose a single member because he's gonna lose that vote because the Lieutenant Governor or Republican will break the tie in the Republican's favor and not his. So he's got a job to really keep his caucus together. And he did a lot of, of those kinds of, of gymnastics to, to, to make sure that, that uh, they kept those numbers on their side. Well, here's a breakdown of, of the, the bills before I start talking about some bills. Uh, here's the breakdown of them. Uh, like I said, the, the, the budget hasn't passed yet, but attached to the budget, it's probably about 25 or 30 bills. I have, I have one of them that's still uh, related to the budget. But I think when it's all said and done, we're gonna end up with about 900, 925 bills that were passed once this is finally updated when we finally get the budget out and all the related budget uh, bills. Uh, but, but about half of those, a little over a thousand were defeated. 
And, uh, and so that's, that's a little bit less than 50%, probably about 47% uh, average of bills that get introduced actually make it to, to the governor uh, for, for consideration. Well, let me talk to you a little bit about the budget. You know, I mentioned that the budget is still not complete. We're still technically in a special session right now. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I'm here. Uh, but, uh, but I can tell you a little bit about what we know is, is likely to come out of the budget, even though it's still got that incomplete mark uh, that, that you're probably used to seeing in, when you're in school. If you haven't finished something, you still get the incomplete. Uh, but, but hopefully we'll finish that soon. But, so the two-year budget, we're looking at about nearly $160 billion budget. I remember, this is my 13th session. I remember when we first started, uh, that, was over, that was under $100 billion uh, for our two-year budget. And so now you can see just in 13 years how much it's grown by 50% our, our entire budget. The good news about the, uh, the pandemic, I would say, is, is our economic situation in Virginia. And part of it is that we, we really did think that the economy was going to tank uh, during COVID. And, uh, and it didn't, in, in, in Virginia at least. And, and so we, we, we sort of undercounted what we, what we expected to come in. Uh, and so we have a surplus, a big surplus, historic by, by any measure. Just before we went into session, so we closed out last fiscal year, we had a $2.5 billion, $2.6 billion surplus uh, just going into to, to the session. So we had cash on hand. But for the economy, I tell you, you know, the economy has been doing well. A lot of people have been doing well. Um, there's been some people that have been left behind, some businesses that have closed and, and, and has a, haven't come back and won't come back. Uh, people unemployed. But for those that did stay employed in Virginia, and you know, we've got the backstop with the federal government and, and whatnot, uh, and, and a lot of trade associations and people related to the government that do their work, uh, they, they, they were doing quite well. And, uh, and as a result, we ended up with nearly $15 billion uh, in surplus money uh, going in for the next two years. So we have a lot of money to play with. I mean, I've, I've been here in, in, in both scenarios where we've been in a recession when it's no fun to, to cut programs. Um, but it's also hard to, when you have money, to figure out how to spend it. And that really is where the debate is, is that we're, we're trying to figure out is with all this revenue, this surplus that we have, what are we gonna do with it? Uh, Governor Yunkin would like to see a big portion of it primarily go towards tax cuts, tax reductions. Uh, whereas a lot of Democrats would prefer that it, it some of it go towards tax reductions, um, but a lot of it go towards underfunding of core services, human services, affordable housing, uh, senior services, uh, transportation, those education, those areas that have been ignored for, for really decades that we finally have an opportunity to, to put some real investment in. Uh, that's what we would like, like to see. I didn't mention that uh, in this, this last bullet here that uh, the federal government, uh, Congress, they do do something occasionally and they did something right this time. They, they passed an infrastructure package, which has been sort of on the agenda for probably about 10 years, uh, finally got it passed. And uh, it's gonna mean about $8 billion for Virginia over the next five to seven years uh, that is going to, and this is set aside from what I talked about with the surplus. This is just federal dollars that's gonna be trickling into Virginia over the next five years or so so that we can uh, build infrastructure, builds and, and build bridges and roads and rail and those kinds of things. So uh, Virginia's sitting pretty good when it comes to making some uh, real, buying down some investments uh, in our infrastructure needs. And I didn't mention broadband, but that's, that's something that we have already been, been uh, working on. We're gonna be one of the first states in the country that has every corner of the Commonwealth covered by broadband. So rural areas will have that access, that real last mile that's been really challenging. So let me talk a little bit about the specifics that we know that is likely to be in the budget. And again, there's not, I'll, I'll be sounding a broken record, there's no deal yet, but we have heard that there is some consensus on some of the items. And so I mentioned uh, earlier in my talk that the, the taxes were the big issue. Once you can solve where the, how much you're gonna set aside for taxes, then everything else just sort of comes together because you can start putting in folding in the rest of the money into core services and where you put that. So there will be a rebate. We think it'll be $300 uh, for individual taxpayers, $600 for couples that file jointly. Uh, that'll be a one-time tax rebate. Uh, that will likely come sometime in the summer and fall, whenever they can get it together. Once the governor signs the budget, then it's just a process of putting it all together and getting the checks in the mail. 
the big issue that you've heard a lot, that a lot of, probably a lot about this, it started on the campaign trail, was eliminating the, the grocery tax. And Governor Youngkin campaigned on this. Actually, Governor Northam campaigned on it four years ago when he was running for governor as well, too. And one of the things that Governor Northam found out, and of course, I think Governor Youngkin has now found out, is that the get grocery tax, while it makes a, a good, good, it's like the eliminating the car tax, if you remember that with, uh, with Governor Gilmore, he made that his, his mantra for running for, for governor and won on it. Uh, but the issue with the grocery tax is, is part of it goes to the state and the other part goes to localities. And you see it's broken out there. It's a total two and a half percent tax that you pay on your groceries. And the governor's proposed to eliminate all of it. Well, if you eliminate all of it, you can, you can figure out how to deal with it on the state side. But the localities depend on that 1%. And so if we're going to eliminate the entire grocery tax, we have to figure out a way to backfill, in other words, to refund our local governments that depend on, for their operations, they depend on that 1% uh, grocery tax. It may not sound like a lot, but for a lot of localities, it's a tremendous amount. And when you add up the grocery tax receipts uh, in, in any jurisdiction, it does add up. And it's really important, that 1% is really important to localities. So not clear what the, what the budget conferees are gonna come up with there, uh, again, if they if they eliminate the entire thing, they have to figure out a way to pay for it because it's not it's not going to be something that you can just credit. Uh, and so another thing that the governor wants to do, and this is also a sticking point, he wants to double the standard deduction. Uh, that will cost a little over two billion dollars, and that will eat away a lot of a big big chunk of our of our uh, surplus uh, if we go ahead and do that. Um, I think he's going to get something on that. I just don't think he's going to get a doubling of it. I think it'll be probably somewhere in the middle. It's going to be a compromise, I think, more than likely what we're going to see. Um, we have heard a lot about our teachers in Virginia, not so much Arlington. Arlington does a really good job in paying its teachers. It's got to be competitive in order to do that. Um, but I do anticipate a 10% pay raise uh, for teachers and for state employees. Um, it's going to be 5% for each of the two years, totaling to 10%. And that will get us to just the average, sort of the median for what we pay our teachers and our state employees. That's, that's been a battle cry for a number of years to pay our teachers at a national average. Uh, and, and so we're, we're, we're well on, on that way to do that. In Arlington, we've, we surpassed that, uh, but, um, but in other parts of the state, they, they don't, they're well below that average. And so we're trying to tap that up to recognize the important work that our teachers do uh, in Virginia. And also going to put some significant pay raises in, in law enforcement, our sheriffs, our local police, and our corrections officers. They, they are also well below the targeted uh, me median for just to be competitive in their field of law enforcement. Uh, attrition is really bad in those areas as well, too. So we're trying to, to, to put some money into, into that workforce. And there's some other things here I'll highlight. I'll put some more money in school construct construction. Um, you, you think about Arlington, we, we're building schools, seems like all the time, there's, there's a new school going up every few years or so, and trying to renovate some schools. But schools across the state are in, are in bad need of repair, leaks in the ceiling. Um, you think about the ventilation issue that we have with COVID, there are some schools that don't have any ventilation to speak of at all. They have no air conditioner, no heat. And uh, I mentioned leaks in the roof and things like that. Well over 100 years old in a lot of schools, inner cities, in rural areas uh, really need some, some help from the state level. It's not something that we normally do. We normally don't get into the business of, of funding local schools construction. That's usually a local issue. Uh, but for a lot of these localities, they really need the assistance. They just don't have the tax base that Arlington has to draw down in order to, to pay for those infrastructure needs. There's gonna be more money in behavior health. You probably hear quite a bit about our behavior health issues, substance abuse, uh, people with intellectual disabilities and mental illness, uh, all that's on the rise. And, and we're trying to, to get ahead of that and try to meet those needs. Uh, well, let me talk a little bit about some legislation. And, um, and a lot of people, certainly on this call, have been the beneficiaries of some of the changes in voting laws over the years, over the last couple of years. I think COVID kind of drove people to do this because people didn't want to leave their house. So we really did make uh, early voting a big emphasis and, and people want to keep it. And so a lot of these things at, at first were temporary type things that we that we lifted uh, for the uh, election in 20, 2019, 2020 rather. And, uh, and people liked that. People thought that that was convenient. So uh, last, I guess about two years ago, we made those laws permanent. And, um, 
And this year, the House uh, had some different ideas. Uh, House Republicans uh, put in some bills to reverse a lot of those things. Um, they wanted to uh, put the photo ID requirements back in. They wanted to uh, disband, uh, do away with the, the absentee drop boxes. I don't know how many took advantage of those. I, I never took, I always like to vote in person and have been able to, to do that. Um, but, but I know many people, I'd sit there and, and watch some of the votes and work some of the polls and there'd be a drop box right there and I'd, and I'd see people drop it off. So I know they're used uh, pretty heavily and, and so they're very convenient for a lot of people, these absentee drop boxes. But there was a bill introduced to, to do away with that. Um, there was a, a bill to, to do away with no excuse absentee voting. You know, we, you remember in the old days, not that long ago, you used to check off a box as to why you were voting absentee. You had to come up with a reason. And, um, and there was a bill introduced to, to, um, to do away with that. Uh, early voting, uh, you know, we've always had early voting. It's sort of called it absentee voting, of course. And it was and it usually started about 14 or 15 days before the election. Uh, but uh, two years ago, we passed a law to extend that to 45 days before the election. So we extended it much longer. A bill was introduced to revert it back to the 15 days, 14, 15 days. And um, all those bills were introduced. All those bills were passed the House and um, on, on a party line vote. Uh, but they failed in the Senate. The Senate defeated them. And that. This goes into my divided government uh, part uh, because some of these bills, all these bills that I'm going to talk about here, passed the House, but they failed in the Senate. Well, minimum wage, you probably know that uh, Virginia is, uh, is, is one of those states that prior to a couple of years ago, uh, they pegged their minimum wage to the federal minimum wage, which was $7.25 an hour. And uh, they've, uh, we've moved it up uh, recently to $9 an hour to, to go up to $15 an hour by 2026. Well, bill was introduced and it passed the House, failed in the Senate, but passed the House to cap that minimum wage at $11 and not go any higher. Uh, and again, that, that bill was both those bills, a couple of different versions of those bills that would cap at $11 an hour uh, failed in, in the Senate when it, after it passed the House. Well, I, I put this slide here on, on purpose because I don't think you can read it. And, uh, but I wanted you to know that a lot of progress, and, and I, I don't take it personally, of course, I used to chair the Public Safety Committee when Democrats were in charge and all of the gun violence prevention bills that we passed, a lot of successes that we've had uh, over the last couple of years when I was chair have all been tried to be repealed. And, and, and I'll run through a few of these really quickly. Um, repealing the uh, one handgun a month. You know, you, you can only buy a current law one handgun per month. They don't want to have all these people going out buying a bunch of guns uh, to, to either sell to their friends or, or hand out for, for different purposes. And, um, and so that law is in place, but there was a bill to replace that and, and, and allow you to buy as many handguns as you want, as you can afford. Um, it would allow you to carry guns in churches, allow you to carry guns in daycare, um, it would, um, the red flag law, which was a law that you could, if, if you had a, a loved one that was uh, a danger to themselves or others in a court, a court were to order that that person uh, was a danger to themselves or others to order that all those guns be removed for a cooling off period. Um, that was repealed as well too. Um, anytime, any requirements that you report a lost or stolen gun, once you realize that it's lost or stolen, uh, that was repealed, allowing you to carry guns in the in the Virginia Capitol, allow you to carry guns in the um, in the government building, the Bosman building, for example. Uh, we, we we passed a law that allowed Arlington to, to take advantage of that. You probably noticed there's now signs if you ever go to parks or community centers that you're not allowed to carry have a firearm in those facilities. Um, there was a bill introduced in the House that would allow that would revert that 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 would allow you to carry guns in community centers and and things like that. Uh, so the, all these bills that, that were here, uh, most of them, most of them, well, they're all introduced. Most of them passed the House. Some just weren't heard because they're too controversial. But they all passed the House, and those that passed the House were defeated in the Senate. So none of these bills passed. That's the good news. Uh, but, but you ought to know that, that, uh, that, that there is an interest to try to repeal a lot of these, what I believe, are common sense gun violence prevention laws. Uh, on education, um, you know, the, the, the governor uh, campaigned uh, very strongly on making education a cornerstone, centerpiece of his platform. 
And you remember a big part of that was uh, critical race theory. That was a, that was a big one. And, and also masks in schools was another one, one, big one. And they were so important to the governor. In fact, the day that he was sworn into office in January, that very day, right after he, he put his hand down uh, after swearing on the Bible, uh, he, uh, he signed uh, two executive orders. His very first executive order was to ban critical race theory, which, which is a theory that is a college level, university level course that is not taught in public schools. However, he thought it was so important that he signed an executive order to ban critical race theory uh, in, in all of our public schools, which it's not taught in public schools. And his second executive order were to um, allow individuals, students, parents, to make the decisions of whether or not to wear a mask in school. Uh, and, um, and that got a lot of controversy. In fact, uh, that very day, I believe it was, um, the Arlington Public Schools said, absolutely not. We are not gonna abide by your order because it's not constitutional. And um, the, the governor cannot unilaterally do an executive order on banning, banning masks or, or making it the choice of masks of, for the students or the parents because that's governed by statute. And, and they were right. Arlington was exactly right. We had passed a law uh, right when COVID started that uh, localities had the decision to, to whether or not to wear, to require masks as a mandate or not. The governor cannot, under constitutional law, the, the governor cannot supersede statute. Uh, if the governor doesn't like the law, he can change the law. And uh, well, he can, he can put it in a bill. He can't change the law, but he can put in a bill have someone put in a bill, and if it passes, he can sign it, and then that will trump the, the the underlying statute. And that's what he did to his credit. So his executive order didn't mean anything, uh, but he did. He was able to get a couple extra votes on the Senate side, and they did pass a law during the middle of the session. They 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 fast tracked it, and to his credit, uh, he was able to sign that into law. And so I believe it was March first is when it went to effect. That 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 point forward. It's up to the uh, parents to decide, parents and students, if they're of age, to decide whether or not to wear a mask. And, um, and I can tell you that's not at this point because COVID is now starting to swirl. It's, it's not having a good impact in Arlington. I, I have three kids in Arlington Public Schools and uh, I get reports constantly about uh, COVID spreading throughout the schools and things like that. So um, it's, um, but it's one of those things that's now the law and, uh, and masks are optional right now. Well, here's a couple of things that, that were also failed. For those of you that don't know about uh, constitutional amendments, uh, how we pass in Virginia, it's actually pretty easy compared to the Congress and how they pass constitutional amendments. It's a very high bar to pass a constitutional amendment uh, at the U.S. federal level, but the state level, it's much, much easier. Uh, it might not sound like it, and I'll describe it to you. Uh, you have to pass a resolution uh, in one year, one session, and then the very uh, that that very same year, you have to have an election, an intervening election, and then the new a state election, I should say, state election, and then the very next session, you pass the identical resolution, and then if you get through all of that, then at the very next election, it goes to ballot for for the voters to make the final decision, and so there were two, and you, you're probably used to to seeing these constitutional amendments. Uh, we usually send you one or two a year. Uh, these were two that you were going to see in November. Unfortunately, they, they were defeated in the House. Um, they made it all the way to the finish line, except for that, that, that one last session to get it through. One was we're one of the very few states in the country that um, require that when someone is a, a, completes their prison term, their felon, they complete their prison term, in order for them to have a restoration of voting rights, they have to fill out an application and send it to the governor and the governor, he or she, and makes the determination of whether to approve that application for that restoration of rights. So we're one of very few states that do it that way. And so this constitutional amendment would have enshrined in our constitution to make this restoration of voting rights automatic. So you didn't have to go to the governor. That was defeated. The other one that was defeated was, was I think the biggest surprise to a lot of people was uh, same-sex marriage. Uh, for those of you that were, I think it was probably, oh, in the early 2000s, mid through 2000s or so, uh, we passed a constitutional amendment in Virginia. It's in our constitution that defines marriage between one man and one woman. 
Well, of course, subsequently, the United States Supreme Court has, has ruled that to be unconstitutional, that same-sex marriages can, can exist uh, in the states. And, but we still, nonetheless, we still have that in our Constitution. Now, the U.S. Constitution, as you probably know, uh, trumps the, the state Constitution uh, because it's a constitutional right, a federal constitutional right. Uh, but nonetheless, it's still in our Constitution, and so this amendment would have repealed that. Uh, taking it out of our constitution, uh, but it it passed the Senate. Um, I'm gonna sound like a broken record, but it, then it failed in the House, and so um, that did not. Fortunately, you're not going to get to see that. So we have to start the process all over again uh, for that to to come back. A couple of my bills, uh, I passed uh, about 17 bills this session, uh, so the, I had a pretty good year, especially for someone that's in the minority. Um, but um, but I, I got four bills vetoed, which I've never had. I've only had one bill vetoed in my entire 13 years uh, until this year. I had I had four, and um, and and I didn't think they made sense. I I think a lot of them were, and you know, to get a bill, of course, to the governor. I mean, even though we are of different parties, the to get a bill to the governor, these were bipartisan bills. That's the only way me now in the minority I can pass a bill is for, to get Republican support. And most of these bills uh, had significant uh, Republican support in it. These were all bipartisan, uh, but yet the governor saw fit to, to, to veto the bill. And um, I, I think it was more of a uh, sending a message to Arlington more than anything else. It, 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 I don't think that he dislikes me or anything like that. I've not met him, but, um, but I think he sent a little message to Arlington. He did the same to uh, the Senator from Alexandria, Senator Eben. He vetoed nine of his bills, and um, but these, these a lot of these bills didn't make a lot of sense of why he he vetoed them. Um, like I said, I don't think he's mad at me because he signed fourteen of my other bills, so um, you know, thirteen of my other bills. So so I don't think he's he's furious with me or anything. But but some of these bills that he vetoed did, didn't make as much sense uh, to a lot of people. And so I'm gonna go ahead and wrap up uh, here, Anita. But um, but a couple of things that I just wanted to mention that 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 my office hears a lot about. And, and that was uh, the first, the Washington commanders, I'm still getting used to saying that. Uh, you know, there's a bond package before the General Assembly right now, it's in conference committee uh, that would allow, I think it's about $250 million that it would set aside anywhere from 250 to $500 million that would set aside money for the Washington commanders to help them with, to offset costs for building a, a stadium. And, um, and, and, and I don't, I, I have not heard anyone, I've, I've probably, I've lost count, but there's probably about 150, 175 uh, people that I've heard from uh, on this from my constituents and every single one of them have, have said to vote no. And I have, I voted no the, the entire way. Not a single person has said to, to give the commanders any more tax breaks uh, that we could use for other purposes uh, in the state. Um, but that hasn't come out of conference yet. You know, there's a, the attorney general has opened up a, a an investigation uh, for some uh, financial dealings uh, from from the uh, Washington football team, uh, formerly Redskins, and of course there's been allegations about uh, sexual assault going on at, at uh, Redskin Park, which I guess it's Commander Park now, uh, in Loudoun County, Virginia, um, and and so I, I wish the Attorney General would would investigate that, but I but nonetheless there's credible people that have come forward uh, to talk about that. And, and for, but for a lot of reasons, I don't think Daniel Snyder uh, needs a state tax break to build a stadium uh, in Virginia. And, and anytime these, these, these initiatives have, have started in other states or other teams, it's been a huge loss, financial loss for the, for the locality or the state that has that set aside that, that money. The other thing I'll just mention is marijuana. Um, as, as you probably know, that was sort of the big story a couple of years ago is we, we did pass a law that uh, made marijuana possession legal in Virginia. You can grow up to four plants and you can have possession of up to an ounce. Uh, and and it, it's, it's, it's not a misdemeanor, it's not a felony, it's not any of that. You, you, you as an adult, you have to be an adult, just to be very clear on that, it's, it's illegal for underage. Uh, but sales are illegal. And so you might be asking yourself, well, if I can possess it, how do I get it? Well, I'm not supposed to tell you that, but, but I, and I don't know. But um, and that's my story. I'm sticking to it. But but we're trying to figure out a way to bring the sales because the sales do, do happen in 2024. And we were trying to accelerate that and create a regulatory process. I think what you will see and it will happen. 
at one point their sales will be legal in Virginia. I think what, um, what, what you're gonna see is a regulatory framework that looks a lot like the ABC liquor store model. Um, you're not gonna see one of these retail stores on every corner or anything like that. I don't want to alarm you on that, but it, it'll be like ABC where they will have a certain number of licensors, licensees throughout the state uh, that will be able to sell. And a lot of people, what we want to do is, is because marijuana laws had disproportionately affected people of color, there's been a big push to for the regulatory uh, scheme, whether it's the growing of the marijuana or the manufacturing, refining it, and the sales of it, to, to give opportunities for equity, for people of color to benefit from marijuana sales, to, to give them an a fair opportunity to bid on some of these projects and things like that. What we don't want is we don't want some large company, maybe it's a tobacco company who, who, who has sort of the distribution and, and a, you know network already set up in order to, to do a lot of this stuff. We don't want them to come in and just take over the market. And so we wanna allow opportunities for other people, other Virginians to come in, particularly people of color, to have the opportunity to benefit from it. So that's all gonna to have to be worked out, I think next year in the 2023 session. We have to figure out the regulatory scheme because whether we like it or not, the retail sales are going to start in 2024. And so we've got to get the regulatory framework uh, together. So that's the last, oh, I, that is not the last slide. Redistricting. Um, redistricting impacted Arlington slightly, not, not a tremendous change. Uh, we are going to, that first uh, map there that you see is sort of that, um, I guess that's sort of a purple bluish color. Um, that's district one. That's my district. Um, and, and so that's a, um, it keeps my district entirely in Arlington County there. The green district there, is, that's district number two. That's an interesting uh, drawing there. Uh, that's a community of interest of high rises on Metro, the Metro corridor. And it, and it kind of goes around, starts around the Boston area. I still have a little bit of Boston, um, but if you follow the uh, orange line from Boston to Roslyn, you can see how it circles there at the very top there in the middle. Uh, that's, that's National Cemetery. And it curves all the way around to pick up Pentagon City and Crystal City. And so the Metro corridors, that's a Metro line, orange line on the RB corridor, there's Pentagon City, there's, there's uh, blue and yellow lines in Crystal City and Pentagon City. And they're all high rises. You know, that's been Arlington's sort of smart growth for, for probably 50, 60 years probably 60, 70 years since the Metro was, was built in, you know, when they built the Metro, uh, the, the Arlington's growth policy, smart growth policy has been to have these high rises near the Metro and have things taper down. And so that district was drawn with that community of interest in mind. And then the, the, the district number three there, which is sort of a, um, I don't know what color that is, maroonish, that's district number three there, uh, that's South Arlington, uh, entirely South Arlington. It, which would be included. And it picks up a little bit of Alexandria uh, there as well too. And switching over to the Senate down there at the bottom, that pink color there, I know that color, that is that is um, the 31st district, I believe that's the number there. Um, or maybe it's the 40th, I can't see. 40, maybe it's 40th district. That's Senator Favola's, uh, she's in that seat right now. She has pretty much all of Arlington. And so uh, she, she used to have to go out to Loudoun County that's how far her, her district stretched at one time. And so now it's not there anymore. And now it's entirely, almost entirely in Arlington. There's still a little bit left over just because of the population and that blue color there at the bottom right. Um, I don't know that, I can't see if that's 39th district or not, but, um, but anyway, that blue color is uh, Senator Eben. He's gonna have a little part of Arlington. Uh, he'll have some Pentagon City and Crystal City area there, a little bit of Sherlington, uh, Fairlington area right there. So. Um, that, that makes up Arlington now. So it's, it's uh, we, we used to have three senators. Now we're gonna go down to two and we used to have uh, five delegates. Is that right? Three, four, five delegates. And um, is that right? No, we said four, dele four delegates and now we're going down to three. And so, um, so that's it. So I, that's, my, um, that's my presentation. And I'll, I'll hand it back over uh, to you for Very questions. Good. Thank you so much, Delegate Hope. Um, we've got some questions here that have come in. First of all, thanks for the zinnia seeds. We do like uh, uh, those every year. Are there any consensus, areas of consensus that uh, high level that the Democrats and Republicans agree on either in the House or the Senate or both? 
Yeah, I think you're going to see the budget is going to be, you know, the budget, I, I, I probably undersold the budget. The budget is going to be historic in a lot of, a lot of places. And I think you're going to see a budget that comes out that has unanimous support, if not near unanimous support. Um, historic investments in our, first of all, you, there's going to be tax cuts in there that are going to be built in permanent backs, well, as permanent as you can be until we run out of money, but but there's, there's certainly going to be tax cuts in the big tax cuts. Uh, but there's also going to be historic investments in our schools in health and human services and transportation. And, um, and everyone agrees that those have been underfunded, uh, especially human services for, for a long, long time. And so I think you're going to see near unanimous consensus there. On the legislation, you know, I only highlighted the stuff that's controversial. Uh, we agree on most stuff. You know, that, that one of the first sides that I, that chart that I showed where there's a, a lot of bills that passed, was, I think there was probably about almost 900 bills that we passed. I'd say probably 70 or 80% of those passed on, on a unanimous vote. So um, there's little things that we agree on, some good government type, type things, technical changes in the law uh, that we agree on. Um, I just highlighted the big stuff um, that, that sort of like had been in the news and things like that. And, um, and I'd probably do a disservice when I, when I only talk about that. And so I appreciate the question. The vast majority of things that we do here are on consensus. And it's just the only way we can move very quickly on things. Uh, but it's the stuff that everyone talks about in the news that, and they're consequential things, they're the big things that right. we have some, some philosophical disagreements. Okay, next question is how many, how, what portion of the surplus would be from business taxes versus uh, individual taxes? Is that possible to, to break out that surplus figure? 18 billion was it? Yeah, yeah. I, I haven't seen the, uh, well, certainly I haven't seen the budget, but I haven't seen anything that, that, that zones in on, on business taxes per se. Um, the only thing that we've released that we've heard about are on the, uh, the individual uh, tax. Uh, Is there a difference in approach on uh, tax relief from the governor's office to uh, make that tax relief targeted to individual taxpayers? Well, you know, yeah, there is, there is a philosophical difference. I, I think the governor would like to to have it focused on people, and that's sort of the the earned income tax credit that that uh, sort of uh, differentiates us. Uh, we like to focus on people that are lower income, uh, that that really do need the help, and I think the governor would like to focus it on some of the higher income earners as well, and sort of swoops everyone. In that dub doubling the standard deduction is something that is a uh, I think takes a sledgehammer to it and, uh, and really benefits people at the higher end of the level and it, and it, and it benefits people at the middle because it gives them a, a doubling that standard deduction is a big benefit to them. Uh, but people at the very lower income, people making a minimum wage and things like that, uh, that's how we'd like to see, see it taxes targeted uh, to lower wage people. I think at the end, I think you're gonna see everyone's gonna benefit a little bit. And I think it probably goes back to my earlier point about divided government. Uh, the governor's going to get some some things that he wants, and I think Democrats are going to get things that they want as well to sort of a targeted approach to lower income, middle income Virginians. Okay, um, just to point out, this is from Maureen, who I think you know here, our president this year. Uh, if the Supreme Court hypothetically took away uh, the right or, or reduced the right to same sex marriage, just to be clear, then the Virginia Constitution, as it's currently written, would be in effect. Is that right? Well, that's true. And, and, and that is, in fact, a, a, a point that the people on the opposite side said. Now, now, as far as I know, there's not a case pending or, or going towards the Supreme Court, but that doesn't mean that states won't try to do that. Uh, but that has been one of the reasons uh, the opposition has said, let's not pass this constitutional amendment, because this Supreme Court may rule reverse that decision uh, and, uh, and, and, that, and we want that to prevail. And so uh, we want to keep our Virginia constitution intact. So yes, that, that is a possibility if the, if the Supreme Court were to uh, overturn that, that Supreme Court decision. That's right. That's why there's a difference uh, in state level and federal level uh, issues that we have to keep in mind. Uh, I'm going to hold one other comment and ask you, would you like to highlight your committee work just for one minute? And then we've got one more question and we'll let you go. Sure. I, uh, I'm on the Health, Welfare, and Institutions Committee. Been on that committee for 13 years since I've been in office, and I have pretty good seniority there. I'm on the Courts Committee as, as well, too. I'm also second in line to, to take over the chair of that. And, uh, and I've been on that for 11 years. And then I'm on the uh, Public Safety Committee, uh, in which I chaired 
I mentioned that earlier, uh, and public safety oversees all of the gun violence prevention bills, but also law enforcement, our jails and our prisons uh, and our Homeland Security. Very good. Um, this may not be directly related to your work, but um, you know, it's of concern that there is a fallacy going around on why uh, Virginia uh, should or shouldn't teach critical race theory and schools. And um, you know, it's it uh, seems to be an issue with uh, it's a it's a solution in search of a problem to a lot of people. So, is there any effort in the legislature to try to uh, debunk the effort to stop that? Well, sure. Uh, there's, you know, I mentioned Governor Yunkin's first executive order was to ban it, which it doesn't exist. And then there was a piece of legislation, I didn't mention it, that, that passed the House to do that very same thing. And, um, and it failed, it passed the House, but it failed in the Senate. And, and any time that you debate those bills, you take that opportunity to explain to the patron of the bill that you, you are, Anita, you took the words out of my mouth. It is a solution in search of a problem. It doesn't exist in our public schools. And so, you know, wh why you're introducing a bill that, that is a fallacy is, is, is a waste of the General Assembly's time. But nonetheless, it's a messaging point. And, and I think that that is, the, that is the point of the bill. Very good. Uh, I, two questions, one comment. Mary Dooley is your legislative assistant and she's just terrific. You uh, wanna give a shout out to her. She Thank is you. located in Arlington, is that right? In the Arlington office or Richmond? In Arlington. Well, she does both. But she, so she's here with me in Richmond when we're here, but she lives in Arlington just like me. So she's an Arlingtonian. And you've got your contact info up for everybody to uh I to do. Ask I do. And, and yeah, for further questions, if I can ever be of service, uh, make sure, let, please let me know. If you need zinnia seeds, you need extras, uh, call my office, email me, and um, you know, glad to be there for you. Okay, well, we really appreciate, where are you going for your summer vacation? Hopefully you're gonna be done here pretty soon. And can you make any plans or do you have to just be ready to come to Richmond at the drop of a hat? You, when we're in special session, you have to be flexible. Uh, we do have some uh, trips planned. We're gonna go to Jamestown and Williamsburg. If you haven't been to Jamestown, you know, since we celebrate our 400th anniversary, you should do so, you can do yourself a treat. I'm gonna go down there. We'll probably go to the beach a, a, a little bit and, um, you know, maybe little side trips. I, I got kids that are, that are, they're teenagers. And so um, they got plans uh, at the swimming pool. So uh, we're going to work around their schedule best we can. Well, very good. Thank you so much for joining us today and uh, good luck with everything. Thank you. Let's see here. Gary, I think we're done.